So, Nana, yeah. I would actually uh, start asking you because uh, you've been there recently. Nana, Nana Moose, uh, for the ones who, who don't know her, she is, uh, she is a Danish foreign correspondent and she has been the only Dane living in Afghanistan for the past several years. I'm not, I'm not sure about uh, the amount of years. You can, you can tell us about it. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I've been living in Afghanistan since uh, 2019 and been living there for more than the first year of the Taliban rule as the only Danish um, <coughs> correspondent living there. Um, and um, I've been thinking a lot about the role of hope in stories leading up to today. And because uh, I think it's obvious to, to most people that we love it. And uh, we love stories of people who overcome something. We love, yeah, we love the, the, uh, the fact that someone does something despite of, of the circumstances. And, uh, and I think that's totally human. Of course, we, we like to imagine that we would do the same, for example. And it gives a lot, I mean, you're a filmmaker, um, to the narrative, to the storytelling, that there is a struggle and you move somewhere. Um, so, so I find it completely relatable and human, but also I do see some challenges, some, some pitfalls maybe, uh, when we tell stories that are difficult, that are in some ways slightly apparently not hopeless maybe, but where it's really like very tough stories out of Afghanistan, for example, where it's hard to see the light. And I can feel, for example, I can feel from people who I work with that they're longing for me to bring that bit of hope into the story. And then how do, you, how do I deal with that? Do I give it? Do I find it? Or do I hold it back? And so that's something I actually think about a lot in, in my work. And um, yeah. yeah, how do you find this like yeah. the drive for always picking, you know, finding the, the yeah. Uh, I actually personally feel feel the urge myself to focus on uh, on hopeful events, hopeful you know personalities who brings hope into my stories, uh, despite of you know everything being pitch pitch black, dark, you know, totally dark, you know, and and and, and no rays of light. And, uh, you know, I, I, I remember myself when I was in Afghanistan during the Taliban takeover. I, I, I arrived shortly after and uh, I was so overwhelmed by the female activists going on the streets and demonstrating against the Taliban. The thing is that there were actually a very small group, you know, if you look at it proportionally, mm. out of many million women in Afghanistan, half of the population, you had like a dozen demonstrating in some of the big cities. But despite of their small amount, it just, you know, it inspired me a lot. Mm. And I focused a lot on them. And I could also feel that, you know, when people, they saw some of the footage, some of the pictures, that it engaged them actually. Mm. So I think, you know, the thing about bringing hope, sometimes, yeah, it's totally unproportional mm. because, you know, why don't we have like Iranian circumstances with millions hundred thousands of people walking on the streets men and women mm -hmm. in afghanistan you had dozens only unfortunately because of you know we can talk about that a little bit later why that's the case but 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 it was still something it helped me it helped me you know it, it, it gave me some spirit and i i felt that it also engaged the audience yeah that was also one of the reasons why i yeah. did it yeah, I work as a, uh, aside from writing, I work as a photojournalist. I sometimes uh, get assignments or get asked from, um, from NGOs if they can assign me to take photos or buy photos from me. And it's, you know, it's, it's on the table. It's not like bet between the lines that they say that they don't want that photo of the hopeless situation because it doesn't engage people. Like, and they know much more about it than I do, how to engage with people. So. Of course, you get people to listen, I think, in a different way. Because if you think from the start that anyway, everything is hopeless, then yeah, I think you give up a bit from the, from the beginning. 
And I think um, what I'm interested in a lot as a journalist is describing what it is to be a human being, what is human life, how do we react, how do we deal with stuff. And, uh, and so I always find people much more interesting when they are three-dimensional. So, so that also means that, well, most people, most of the time, feel more things. You usually never feel only depressed. You also try to maybe, even though you're feeling depressed yourself, you're trying to encourage your mother to see the brighter side or, or the other way around. Uh, you might be seemingly uh, full of spirit and hope, but actually struggling with other things. Anyhow, just to say, I think it's part describing that side is also part of being honest about that people are usually are always three dimensional and they have a lot of complex feelings. And even if we do short stories or small, you know, short stories, it's important to try and put together a picture of a person who is who has all these like different feelings, even though they might not always logically make sense. Um, but I do also think, as I said, like I think there are some uh, pitfalls. I don't know if that's the right English word, but like there are some things that I'm mindful about at least, and I would be curious to also think what you think about it, because um, I see I see two issues with this sort of always highlighting or highlighting the hope side of things, so the hope in a person, the hopeful person, is that, I mean, one is that, especially when we talk about Afghan women, I think there is also, I don't know how exactly to say this the best in English, but to that we kind of always make them heroes. And that is a huge pressure. And it's also a bit unfair, I think, to, to expect of them to always be these like powerful, heroes, queens, who just, you know, can overcome anything. Uh, shouldn't they be allowed to be depressed like I would be? To be completely in the dark, to, you know, struggle with it like the rest of us. I think there's like, we, we really long to, to make heroes out of people. And it also risks sort of, I, would, I don't know if we can say normalize, but a little bit sort of normalize the fact that these people, you know, they're used to overcoming a lot of hard stuff. So, you know, now another difficult thing is facing them, but you know, they've been through diff difficult things before. And we sort of, we minimize a little bit the, the hardship that they're going through. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does, it yeah. does, you know, because I, sometimes I meet people, you know, I'm a Dane, but of African descent, I'm born in Denmark. Uh, but sometimes I meet people like, refugees from other places and or sometimes I talk to people you know of Danish descent also and and when they get to know that you know I'm of Afghan origin they're like yeah your 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 people are like tough the Afghans I'm like you know Afghans they uh, they are out of uh, flesh and blood like everybody else you know and I ha actually have a really good example hmm? uh, it's you, you know him Walid Who's a journalist mm -hmm. in Denmark? He's a correspondent for Information, a Danish newspaper. He was covering uh, the earthquake mm. in Antakya, and he met uh, a guy. He had lived in the city, so he was looking for people that he that he knew. He wanted to be sure that they uh, they survived the earthquake. And he saw this Syrian guy, and he was like, "I'm so happy that you survived." And but but yeah, but fortunately, you are kind of you know Syrians are kind of rough people they've experienced war they can take this you know like an earthquake is nothing for them and he got really angry and he wrote this in the article actually this syrian guy getting really disappointed with what he said and was like we are human beings like you you know pain we feel pain like you feel pain just because mm. we experience exactly. sorrow we've experienced tragedies it doesn't mean that you know that it's normal for us when the next tragedy is mm. coming yeah. It's just as tough as the other one. Maybe worse, because they've been more demoralized than us. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and I can feel, you know, working with editors or producers and things, you know, I, I sometimes, uh, either it's said out loud, I can just sense that they like for me to give them that. Like, can you, 
can we just end the story on that she does have hope or some something like that and it's it's you want to be truthful you know you're a journalist so of course there are many mixed feelings maybe there is a bit of hope maybe there is not and sometimes i can i just it's something i'm working with myself like do shouldn't shouldn't she also be allowed to just to be in the to to be in the dark where she is like where she's that's how she feels you know maybe yeah she does feel some hope so do i highlight that or do i let her other feelings it, i'm thinking of a woman specifically that i that i've actually followed for a long time in afghanistan and then we did a podcast and when they when they made the ban the 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 law that you have to cover your face as a woman in Afghanistan. And, and you know, I felt this like sort of search for, can we just, you know, what if, if does she have her spirits up or what sure. is she going to do? And, you know, it's always different with each story, but in a way I also felt that it was strong to say, actually she's, you know, she's going to wear a burqa and she's super upset and really, you know, uh, in despair about the future of her daughters. Yeah. I mean, it's always different from story to story, but in a way, I felt that was powerful too. Yeah. To say, like, let's be honest, how would you feel? I mean, she feels feels pretty shit. Yeah. And then let it kind of hang there because it's also you kind of it's not what you expect maybe, or you were hoping for yeah. to be given that, and then not to get that payoff at the end. It's it's also powerful, I think. Just to nuance it uh, furthermore. Uh, you did you did some articles. You went in the radio also, doing a story about Afghan women women in rural Afghanistan, hmm. women living in rural Afghanistan, not in the cities. Because you know we have this story, which is true. You know about city, uh, women living uh, in in bigger cities uh, or in communities where they you know the men are a little bit more pragmatic, you know, and 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 the women they are benefiting from the international. Uh, international uh, intervention, uh, international presence, because they could educate themselves, they could work, and all these things, and and uh, but at the same time, you had like a historical uh, threat in Afghanistan that we don't know that much about, about women living in the rural communities, not benefiting from the international presence because they live in extremely conservative environments, and the only thing that they experienced was the war. They only saw the war, so they didn't see anything good from the international presence, but they only only saw the bad things. And these women, you know, you did the report with them. I've been traveling a lot in rural Afghanistan, but only talking to men because the women were, you know, totally, uh, they were, uh, you know, totally uh, no go for men. Yeah, uh, but 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 you had access to the women and talking to them, and they were actually relieved because of the war ended, because the Taliban take over, because, because it was a totally different story for them. So it's just mm. you talking about the layers uh, yeah. on these portraits that we have of Afghanistan and, and the women also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it's, and it's not to say that I'm saying no one ever has hope and everything is always, I mean, of course there is that. What I'm trying to talk about is like, where do we put our focus and what do we highlight and when do we do it and how do we balance things? So. So yeah, I think that was um, yeah, there was a different layer of of, um, of whose hope are we talking about? Yeah. Um, I've I've noticed it as well. This, I don't. This is this is my personal opinion. Let me know if you think I'm wrong. But I I came to think about this like search for the light in the dark and the hope. Uh, the way I see it is also a little bit sometimes a part of our, when I say our, I say the media or the, you know, analysts uh, looking at Afghanistan, our um, sort of very in-depth analysis of the Taliban. I, f I feel like there is, it's, it's sort of related in the sense when you see um, <coughs> Uh, analysts and journalists talking like really trying to analyze the ta Taliban and, and talking about how there are different fractions and you know there are also people who are not agreeing with the ban on girls education and sort of like, really digging for trying to see how can these things change and I've sometimes found myself in these uh, debates and agreeing with these you know it's true there are different kinds of Talibs and uh, there are different kind of opinions 
but I think it sometimes, in my opinion, have overshadowed this like search for maybe they will crumble, maybe <coughs> things will change. Wishful it's, thinking. Exactly, and it's, yeah. in my opinion, overshadowed the reality on the ground. I've sometimes felt like, yeah, this is true. I mean, maybe they something will happen, but can we talk about what they're doing to girls today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. I, I totally agree. I, I, I also catch myself you know, in this mo mode sometimes uh, because, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something positive and there is no, practically there is no political opposition at, in Afghanistan. Uh, it's been banned or they are, uh, they are a part of the diaspora. They fled or they've been killed. Uh, there's no uh, militant opposition. There's, there are no rebel groups. Maybe you have a handful of guys hiding, uh, you know, in some mountains in, in specific profit provinces, but not really active. And the international community, they're not interested in intervening. And at the same time, at grassroots level, you don't have a strong movement trying to resist the Taliban. Mm. So it's all Taliban. So the only place where you can look for rays of light is among the Taliban, you know. And this is, as you've also experienced, also something that I found. I found, you know, a lot of Taliban commanders, also high level, <laughs> Who, they don't agree, you know, with the policy of the Taliban. Uh, they're more pragmatic. They're, it's not because they are enlightened or progressive, but they are least, lesser conservative, lesser extreme in some ways, in, in, on, in, in different areas. And, and, and I'm kind of clinging to them and trying to remember that they are there still, you know. And it's not only me, it's actually also people from the international community. You have these dialogues amongst researchers kind of saying, okay, we have to like hold on to these guys because if we're going to cut them, you know, we're going to cut our ties to them, there's nothing then. Then just going to be isolated, then they're going to treat the Afghans the way that, you know, the most extreme among them want to. So, so I, told, I, I really recognize this. And sometimes, you know, I end up emphasizing too much on this when, when I conversate with people, uh, always trying to remind myself as you're saying, on the ground, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. It's still the same. There's an effective ban mm. on females and girls going to school. Mm. Yeah. And then you can be on the ground and meet these uh, people who are absolutely incredible, who keep doing secret uh, girls' education and full of spirit and, you know, saying they're ready to, you know, keep struggling against the Taliban for a long time. And, and that is speaking of what we're talking about now, that is a super interesting, compelling story because we can all sort of admire them and basically hope that we would do, would I do the same? I don't know. So there are so many interesting layers in that. And then you want to tell that story and you always, I am kind of, how do you, how do you just balance things? How do you tell that story without making it seem like, oh yeah, you know, everything could be different in two weeks. No, because it, it's not going to, as you said, it, this is going to be like this for a long time. So, yeah, it's just yeah. all, yeah, nuances. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's also about priorities in a society, you know. Uh, people are they're saying, why is Afghanistan not like Iran? Why don't you have these mm -hmm. big demonstrations? There's a different history in these two countries. You know, Iran, they've had, you know, they have like a history of, uh, uh, you know, a much vaster history of education and and uh, yeah. and at the same time, you also have you had another political system in Iran also earlier, so you have these two different historical narratives in these mm -hmm. countries. At the same time, you also have an Iran which has been ruled by this theocracy for four or five decades now, and uh, you know there's also been a lot of time to kind of gain the momentum. And, and mobilize themselves among people. You know, these, these revolutions, they don't come from one day to another day. It takes time. In Afghanistan, Taliban rule is new. It, it happened like almost yesterday. Uh, so you, you have a lot of factors working against the Afghans. And at the same time, I talked about the different histor historical, historical developments in these countries. Afghanistan is a more patriarchal society. You know, you have more men who are conservative. Uh, and it's just the case in countries where education is, uh, you know, uh, is not as widespread uh, as in other countries. In, in Iran, people are much more educated. Mm. So, so you don't have this 
backing and you don't have it as a priority you have a lot of other things and it's much poorer country than iran also mm. so for a lot of people Absolutely. specifically in the rural afghanistan but also in the bigger cities the poor families it's more about you know to you know they just want some bread and water you know they they they, they want they want to survive they want food it mass of course yeah, yeah. yeah the pyramid yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. I think we should open up for questions yeah. soon. Yeah, sure. Um, and it, it is really insightful, but also super difficult, I, I find, and difficult to understand. I also uh, heard the other day that Taliban is more or less going from door to door <coughs> to find out how many girls there are in the family that they can marry and have children. I don't know if that's true, but I, I think it is because it was a very reliable source. So there is really sort of suppression of, of the women and girls, uh, and I know it's nuanced and difficult, different in the in the role as you have explained to me, explained to me, uh, and obviously also a lot of most people will have peace uh, and and uh, and you know try and find the daily life I guess, uh, but I was just thinking, you know. It, for, for me, because I do documentaries every day and talk with documentary filmmakers, you know, is it possible to tell a story that's just straightforward how it is and, you know, so and so many are forced marriages and going back, you know, without having this little, that there might be some girls who are learning how to read and write in some private home somewhere and that's really good for these five children. And it's done in the dark, and they have to sneak the girls in and stuff. You know, I I think still it's difficult. Even I I hear all your um, concerns, and yeah, I I don't know. But maybe we should open up to the the, the audience to ask uh, questions for you. Anything I guess you can talk about, you can ask. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hi, thank you so much for such an interesting conversation. I've seen your films, Najib, and I've seen your photography, both amazing. Okay. Um, but what really confuses me is how you can live in a place that is so obviously dangerous and sort of go about your work with that fear present all the time. And I think a lot of journalists struggle to, to really, you know, live with that fear. And it's something that you have to deal with every day when you're living there, when you're reporting from there. How do you manage that? How do you manage that fear and still do your job? Um, living in Kabul now, for me, uh, is uh, a completely different world than living in Kabul as an Afghan woman. Um, the big you know, one of the big changes that happened is that the war ended. So in a way, before August 2021, there was a bigger risk of being at a front line uh, in a war zone in Afghanistan than there was after. And uh, for me as a journalist living in, in Kabul under Taliban, um, I, the biggest, there is a lot of pressure but you know all the time that you're like a, an alien walking around. I could still leave my house and walk down the street and go to a supermarket and, and buy my groceries because uh, I was like an, like an alien um, living in a completely different world. It doesn't mean that there, wasn't a, there isn't a lot of pressure and a lot of struggles, especially if trying to do journalism, but actually um, like fear for my my own life was not a part of of uh, everyday life but it was definitely in my mind in terms of all of my friends one of the things that happened was that so many afghans who were able to do so left uh, in the early days when the taliban came to uh, to power all over the country and uh, and also some of my friends were did not have that option and were still in the country so I would say this is completely on my personal account, but being there, um, what was very hard was to to be with friends and see how their lives were completely different and constantly coming under more and more pressure. And at the same, 
and and not being able to do much. You know, as a journalist, as a filmmaker, you go and you ask someone if they do an interview, and if you're lucky, they say yes, and sometimes they ask what they get out of it, and you say, well, maybe someone will read it, and that doesn't really help people, to be frank, not in the moment, right? Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I hate talking about my experience like that, because everyone else uh, mm -hmm. is struggling way more, but yeah, it's just to say that you're, you're, you're still, although you're living there as a foreigner, you're completely, you know, you know you're able to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, That's the difference. Uh, also, I think you said uh, that actually after Taliban, they don't really feel it's less dangerous than before they got into power, because then you have the fights between that you would be a foreigner, so you could be kidnapped or, you know, under threat, but but now it would be only, uh, yeah. only but now it's the national yeah. Afghans that are... Yeah, the problem is that earlier it was, Afghanistan was one big conflict zone. You had the, the, uh, the war zone areas, which was, uh, which was in the rural Afghanistan, and then you had a lot of terrorist attacks in Afghanistan. You still have it in Afghanistan. But, and you had a lot of them right after the Taliban takeover. It was Islamic State with behind them. They're the enemies of the Taliban. And uh, but 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 for the past, for the past several months, uh, you know, I haven't. Uh, the, the, there's not so much happening. So in that sense, you can say that Afghanistan, you know, it's 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 a safer country to travel in now. You can go from city to city. A lot of Afghans they didn't. They had to, you know, drive from one big city to another. They were afraid of getting kidnapped, stopped by a checkpoint, at a checkpoint, and, and being, uh, being, uh, being killed, being kidnapped. Um, but instead, you have an extremely totalitarian state. It, it's like a hundred percent hardcore dictatorship now. So people they feel surveilled, like they didn't uh, felt before. Uh, they don't have any freedom of speech at all. The risk of getting imprisoned, saying something critical about the Taliban, uh, or as a woman, or as uh, you know, also as a man, but mostly as a woman, if you behave in the wrong way and uh, not according to their codes of conduct. Uh, so in that sense, Afghanistan is much unsafer than before. Uh, so it's, 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 it's it depends on you know what we are talking about. In some ways, Afghanistan is a much safer country. In other ways it's much unsafer than before. And even if you're one of these women that you mentioned earlier, if you're a woman living in the rural Pashtun southern areas where, you know, the war never ended until it actually <coughs> ended. I mean, there was, there was never, you know, girl schools and prosperity and aid coming because there was always conflict. Even if you're one of a woman there who were relieved that finally the bombing and it's gone, the front line is gone, you have, you will have been affected by, by the Taliban coming to power because of the poverty now, yeah. because of the, the lack of work, the lack of food, the lack of everything. So, so everyone's been affected, but in different ways. Yeah, true. It's like you had in some, in, in, you know, in, in minority areas, people were relieved, you know, uh, because of the Taliban, they left, but the consequences have been a disaster for Afghanistan, isolated country, with extreme the poverty. And the kids yeah. sitting and baking the cars and sitting yeah. in the streets and mm. baking. It didn't have anyone, don't have anyone to, to support them. Mm. Single women, they are forced to become beggars. You yeah. know, they cannot work. They cannot, uh, you know, take care of their families anymore. Mm. I think there was a question out there. Was it you? There was a question out there. You? I don't know. Um, I, I read somewhere that the youth movement in Iran had to do with the, a lot of the, uh, the youth had, were seeing stuff on Twitter and Instagram and they were almost all of them was on social media and um, on the internet in different ways. How are the youth in Afghanistan? And do you think the lack of a bigger movement has to do with that? That, that they're not on all these social media platforms? Um, actually, Afghans are very much on social media. Facebook is big in Afghanistan, and people are communicating as well on WhatsApp a lot, and in all these like groups where they also get information and share information. So um, as much as there is coverage, and 
electricity, which in a lot of the country is rare, uh, people actually are um, uh, on, on Facebook a lot, for example. Uh, comparing with Iran, I think there are a lot of different factors in Afghanistan uh, that, as you mentioned before, makes it a very different uh, scenario. One of them being that there's been a conflict for 40 years and, you know, people are exhausted in a, in a different... The youth in Afghanistan has grown up in a war where the youth in Iran has grown up in a completely different context and much more educated as well. So does that mean that Taliban have not closed down the internet or uh, secured it so it's basically everybody can pursue even education support through the internet? I mean, yeah, if you have power and, and you have the, yeah, yeah then, then yeah, people share a lot, um, yeah. write things, write mm -hmm. poems and everything on Facebook a lot, yeah. yeah. It must be said that the freedom of press in Afghanistan was, uh, you know, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a, it was a positive story in Afghanistan. Uh, it was one of the, one of the, you know, uh, it was one of the areas in that part of the world, which you had the most free press, you know, uh, and uh, you had so many medias, and people in Afghanistan they could criticize the president, they could criticize uh, governors, generals. No, in general, without risking them uh, something happening, it happened also. You know, you also had assassinations and killings. But compared to Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Iran, it was paradise, Afghanistan. So in that sense, mm. Afghanistan, you know, Af Af the Afghan landscape has lost a lot. Also, uh, in that, you know, with regards of 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 the freedom of speech and media now. And uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and really good journalists. <coughs> It's not only money coming in to facilitate, you know, starting a newspaper or TV channels, really, really high quality, very talented, very thorough, dedicated journalists, Afghan journalists. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, from your point of view, how do you think as, as we as an international society should should deal with Afghanistan now. I mean, you have this, in, even within Taliban, there's more moderate, pragmatic movements maybe. Uh, should we try and deal with that? Should we try and influence it? Or, or is it an isolation with that? How would, how would we help the, the Afghanistan uh, population the most? Yeah. Do you want to go Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, you know, I I have opinions about it, but also sometimes I don't, I don't feel it's right you know, in the right place that I, I should I should be the man, you know, saying that because the policies of the Taliban they don't affect me, they affect affect the Afghans. But but most of the Afghans that I talk to, they don't want to be isolated economically. You know, they're being hurt. It's not the elite of the Taliban. It's not it's not the commanders in the Taliban, it's not the high level tal talibs who are being influenced by the isolation, economical isolation, etc. And I think there are, you also have some diplomatic uh, processes happening right now where people from the international community, organizations, countries, they try to channel money to the right places. They try to earmark money and uh, resources to the Afghan population so the Taliban, they can take advantage of it. But, but if you also take the other stance and you want to boycott, sanction Afghanistan, it's, it's a different world than 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's a multipolar world. You know, it's, it's just not the West and the US who are deciding everything and who have, who have all the influence. You have the Chinese, you have the Russians, you have the Gulf states also being active different places. So if you turn your back to Afghanistan, you're going to have other players going in and filling out the gaps. Not as much as the West, because the West puts so much money that these countries, they're not going to put that in. They, you know, and they're in Afghanistan because of economical reasons. They're not there because of values or, or you know, the Chinese, they don't care if the girls, they go to school in Afghanistan. They, they say they're against the policies, but practically, you know, it's, it, they don't see it as a big problem for them because they have another kind of international, pol uh, you know, uh, international uh, policy. But but I think I think you know I, I believe in carrot and stick not only stick but also carrot and but I believe in I, I personally believe in engaging with some of the elements in the movement which you hope can can gain an upper hand 
in some way because if you if 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 you turn your back to them they're just going to say okay you know there's you know we we will just you know go the other way because there's nothing to get here and they want recognition some of these guys because what the core of the Taliban the leadership are doing is isolating the country and you have some people in the movement who's not happy about that they're not happy about it from an economically perspective but also from a political perspective because they have ambitions they want to be a country that uh, that engage with other countries yes. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to add something but maybe I can okay. do it later just go no go on uh, I, can wait. No. <laughs> uh, I just uh, came to think of the the bit of the film that we watched in the beginning you see a, an older lady with the white hair Mabuba Siraj is the name and um, I um, I, I know her by now, I've interviewed her several times and I, the first time I met her was actually right after the Taliban came to power. And uh, she has an American passport, she's born and raised Afghan but has uh, lived in exile many years in the US and could have left. She, she stayed, she at that time ran several safe houses for Afghan women who had escaped their families. Anyhow, she decided to stay and I interviewed her a month after the Taliban came to power, something like this. And she said to me at that time, she was like, what's it going to help if we don't talk to them? They are here. I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the plan? Then we're all completely isolated. She was, she was, first of all, very well spoken and has a lot of charisma. And she was like, I'm here to stay and I'm here to talk to them and, you know, t- explain to them. These are, you know, these are fellow Afghans. I must explain to them what I'm doing in these safe houses and so on and so on. Um, I met her again, and I also saw her in TV interviews uh, right after the Taliban had said they would let girls come back to power and then did uh, come back to school, well, power one day, but um, come back to school and then they didn't. And she was completely furious, uh, to say the least. And I've seen her, I think I could say, she's probably better to speak on her own behalf, but lose hope a bit. Uh, she's definitely lost, uh, changed the way she sees that how we should engage with them over time. Uh, because we've just seen all of these big steps back, uh, how, you know, the things that she could, she'd hoped she could explain to them, she <coughs> hoped she could deal with them, you know, and we have seen that the most conservative of them have, you know, been, been leading the way. Um, so anyway, I just came to think of her and I think that it's very telling for many people that I've been talking to that, you know, as Najib said, they they don't approve of the Taliban, but also what are they going to benefit from their entire country being more and more isolated? I mean, nothing. No, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a Latin American and um, my country has been influenced by many other countries, bigger countries, of course. So. Um, I guess my uh, my question is, what do you think the documentary filmmakers, uh, what what's their role in being neutral? Because Western values are very different from Russian values or Chinese values. And if you see what is happening now in Afghanistan, it must be different from a Russian perspective than from an American perspective, for example. <laughs> yeah, uh, what is happening in Afghanistan, you know, is that I can say that from a majority perspective in Afghanistan, local Afghan perspective, because of course Afghanistan is a is a you know it's it, it's a landscape with different groups, political <coughs> opinions, you know, uh, different ethnic minorities, etc. But from a major, majority perspective, you know, what the Taliban they're doing is 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 is, is 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 not in accordance, you know, with them. So in that sense, you know, right now in Afghanistan, it's not even about West, Western values. It's, it's, it's not a discussion about that because, of course, you know, if you go to Afghanistan, you will not have a majority saying s- same-sex marriage or same-sex relations are tolerable or whatever, you know. That's, you know, if I take other subjects, but a lot of the subjects that we are talking about right now, the, some of these fundamental uh, subjects is, for example, education for girls, the right to work for women, and all these things. And and you know, the Taliban they're actually basically they're clinching with the majority view. They are 
they're clinching with conserv a lot of conservative Afghan yeah. views also. Mm. And you know, uh, our focus, most of the filmmakers' focus right now are on these things. Uh, but I, I, I would be able to follow you, for example, if we, if we made films about other things, you know, then maybe, maybe, maybe you know, uh, it, it would be another discussion. I think so, but I understand you, of course, you know, the, the, you know but even, even if you look at it from a, you know, Russian perspective right now also, and if you look at it officially, the, the Chinese, they've also said that, you know, this is not okay. They're not doing anything. They are very pragmatic in their way with uh, dealing with the Taliban and they are investing in the country now and making trade deals with them. But, 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 but officially they're saying to them that this is not okay. Yeah. But of, of course, it's. Um, yeah. I agree with what you're saying. Uh, sometimes it becomes crystal clear that we're, um, that, you know, when a Western politician is talking about Afghanistan and a, a, a member of the Taliban is talking about Afghanistan, they're talking about two completely different things. Um, I sometimes uh, hear that people say, well, you know, the Taliban had said that they would respect, before they came to power, they said they would respect women's rights. What the Taliban has always said um, is that they would respect women's rights within their interpretation of Islam. That's what they've always said. Um, as far as I've never heard them say women's rights full stop. But they're talking about two completely different things. The Taliban would say, in their point of view, they're respecting women's rights as they consider them to be women's rights. Uh, and in this room, I think most, you know, we would consider women's rights to be something else. As a journalist, I think uh, it's tricky sometimes to try and, <coughs> and, and see through this. And, ex and I see it as my role to kind of bridge that, or explain that somehow, to try and to put it into context. This is for them, like, that's what they're talking about when they say women's rights. I think that's kind of my role to try and say that without saying, and that means it's fine. Yeah, yeah, so to say that uh, their interpretation of women's rights is that they can get married, they can have children, they cannot go to school, they cannot work individually, they cannot go around without a poor parents. So, so it's a completely different way. Yeah. Again, yeah. these are some Taliban's interpretations. Yeah. As you said, there are others who have different, and you have very conservative Afghan men, even in the countryside, who also don't agree with what the Taliban is doing now. So. Yeah. There is, there is not one. And you had people in the former government, you know, like a minority, not a majority, but a minority who were against a lot of the progress that the women, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of prog progressive things that had happened, mm -hmm. you know, during the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the former government's rule. So it's kind of, you know, it's more nuanced, but you are, of course you have a majority position among the Taliban and a majority position among the anti-Taliban also. But but I also understand you from, you know, because I, I get you on that uh, about, you know, for example, when the West intervened in Afghanistan, they made it look like that they were going to create a Western society there. And that was, uh, an, you know, a you totally utopic idea and project because the Afghans, they had, you know, they, they, they've had another historical experience. They have other values in many, in many ways. Mm -hmm. And, and and trying to copy a Western society in Afghanistan was doomed from the beginning. And they realized realize that too. Uh, but they cling to some things. Uh, and uh, actually those few things, they also lost those projects. Yeah. I, I think we have to close now. Uh, but with this, lots of food for thoughts. And uh, I was really encouraged that we all continue to focus on uh, the lives of, uh, I don't know, I agree with you, how can we help, it's very difficult, uh, but um, we just have to focus on it and keep talking about it and keep talking if we know politicians and others uh, who can who can help there. And for you too, it's, uh, I mean, I know you you will continue and uh, to, to write about it so we, we don't forget um, the human rights violations that happens there every day. And soon, Najib, your film will come out, I guess, in the autumn? Yeah, I, I think so. I'm not really sure. Yeah. And yeah. have we fixed the title yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Najib's film. <laughs> yeah. Mine and Martin Tam, uh, a former Danish soldier who's become a filmmaker. It's, yeah. it's, it's a film, but it's, 
it's it's not a film about the current situation it's a film about why the west they lost the war in afghanistan we're trying to find some of the answers to that question it's yeah. a very important film i have seen a bit of it uh, most of it, and and I, we can we will look forward to see it. Uh, wasn't it winning hearts and minds at that's, some point? That, that's it's the, the title right title. now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we can look forward to that. And then uh, thank you for coming out this uh, evening. Uh, we had big competition with the free bar upstairs, uh, <laughs> but uh, I I think it's it's really important to to stay focused and you know see films, read articles, look at photos. People don't have as good as life as we have here in Denmark, and then we have to to keep that in mind. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us here.